Good evening, and thank you for joining us for the Dixon's first virtual member preview. I'm Chantel Drake, I'll be your host for this evening, and I'm standing in the galleries in the midst of the installation process for America's Impressionism. We are going to hear from director Kevin Sharp and curator Julie Parati later in the tour. We'll also see a glimpse of Jim C. Ayer's exhibition in the Mallory and Wurzburger Galleries and the interactive gallery exhibition, Charging Station. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, and I hope you enjoy the tour. Kevin, tell us about America's Impressionism, how the exhibition came together, and why this exhibition is important. America's Impressionism is an exhibition that the Dixon Gallery and Gardens organized with the Brandywine River Museum of Art and the San Antonio Museum of Art. And it's a show that takes, I think, a little bit different approach to a somewhat familiar subject, that of, that of American Impressionism. The exhibition looks at a longer arc of time. America's, Americans have a deep investment in this particular style, but it also looks at the geography of American Impressionism because it's a style that starts in actually in France, comes to the United States, mostly on the East Coast, but makes its way across the entirety of the, of the nation. American Impressionism and Impressionism in general is very much the dominant style of its age and this exhibition really looks to expand the conversation of, about this important, this important body of work. And I'm standing in front of the work um, that's very, very special for this, for this exhibition. It's a work by Theodore Robinson. And Theodore Robinson is probably the artist that has as much to do with popularizing Impressionism in the United States as anyone realize that just like in France in the 1870s, in the United States in the 1890s, Impressionism is seen as a complete anathema. It is, it is perceived as the, as the downfall of art. There are plenty of critics who ridicule it. Now, Theodore Robinson was in a unique position to really know the ins and outs of Impressionism and what it was trying to uh, achieve. And what he did, and he, he, he acquires this knowledge firsthand by spending six, seven, eight years in France, much of it in Giverny, and part of it as Claude Monet's next door neighbor. This painting, this painting is produced at the end of, at the end of Robinson's time in France. And it is actually a view of the River Seine. You see the river moving across the, diagonally across the composition. And it is um, the Valley of the Seine near Giverny. And it's painted in 1892, his last year in, his last year in France. And when he returns to the United States, he, his work not only bears the influence of French Impressionism in a, in a really powerful way, but he's also a very, he's a, he's a very, mm, I would say he's a very scholarly man in his way. And he writes for Scribner's Magazine and others about his experience and about his firsthand knowledge of Claude Monet. And it's no coincidence that about that same time, Monet becomes enormously popular in the United States. Thank you. Kevin, tell us a little bit about this painting. Well, this is, a, this is a painting that we borrowed from the Hunter Museum of American Art in Chattanooga, and it's a really marvelous addition to the exhibition, I think. One of the things that America's Impressionism, Echoes of a Revolution, does very persuasively is that more there are probably more women artists in this show than, um, than in most surveys of, America's, of American Impressionism. Um, and this is one of the key figures in, um, in America's embrace of the Impressionist aesthetic. This is a work by Lila Cabot Perry. Um, she was a Boston native. Um, she is very well-traveled. She winds up, you know, Impressionism 
Impressionism has this strong influence of Japan in the aesthetic itself. Well, Lila Cabot Perry actually lives in Japan for three or four years. So she is, um, she comes by her knowledge of the Impressionist aesthetic firsthand as well. She first she encounters it in the late 1880s when she's studying in, in Paris and, and Grez and eventually Giverny. And, um, and this particular painting, it's, she, it's not dated, so we don't know exactly when it was produced or even where it was produced, but I would suspect it's work painted in, it's work painted in France, maybe just, a, maybe just a little bit after 19, 1900, although its, it's circa date is considered to be 1890 to 1900, but given the chronology of her, of her life, um, it's probably a bit later than that. And, um, and, and I'm guessing that rather than New England, um, it probably actually does represent, represent the area around Giverny, where she spends a considerable amount of time. The small stream that you see in the foreground looks, like, looks a bit like, the, like the, um, the, the, the small river Ept, which is a tributary of the Seine and is painted by any number of American artists and painted by Monet, and by Monet himself. These poplar trees are pollarded. That's very much a French technique to pollard the trees, to prune them back hard. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm almost certain that, I'm almost certain that this is a painting from the early 20th century during her second tenure in the Giverny region. It's certainly got the, 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 the attention to light the, the vigorous brushwork, um, even, the, even what looked like irises growing next to the stream right here, um, appear to be very much of a, um, we see them in other paintings of the Giverny area. So it's, it's a marvelous example of an American taking the Impressionist aesthetic and very much making it, making it her own. And this is, a, this is a really important work to the exhibition and emblematic of many others. Thank you. Well, Julie. Hey, Chantel. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Great. Excited to be at an opening. I know. Me too. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about this painting and this artist. Sure. Yeah. I wanted to stand in front of this painting because I thought it was one of the most beautiful and a really great chance to talk about another arts colony in France. I think Giverny gets a lot of, um, not attention, but study as an arts colony for American artists in France. But there were other places in France where art, American artists congregated. And um, this painting by Robert Bono shows a, a colony called Grey at um, the southern edge of the Forest of Fontainebleau, which um, some of us uh, Dixonians know is a long time um, hub for artistic creativity. Um, so Robert Bono is an American who he goes to France like a lot of American artists to study at the you know at the Academy Julienne or whatever to get this academic training. Um, but slowly becomes enamored of plein air painting, of, of Impressionism, especially when he goes to Gray. Um, so his paintings that are from there have this really beautiful light to them, kind of a hazy atmospheric quality, which is what we're looking at here. Um, and a lot of times show the peasant women, men and women um, that are working in that area. So we have a woman here who's hand harvesting. Um, she's got her scythe there. Um, but she's painted with the same kind of um, choppy brushwork, quick brushwork, that the rest of the landscape is painted. And I think that's really beautiful too. Also for um, us at the Dixon, this painting is kind of interesting because less than a decade after um, this work was painted in 1890, Robert Bono will marry Bessie Potter Bono, who uh, we have two sculptures by her in our collection, so it's kind of yeah. nice to make that connection between a, a visiting painting like this one and an artist that we already know here. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Julie. Sure. Greetings from the Brandywine River Museum of Art. My name is Amanda Burden, curator at the museum and of the exhibition, America's Impressionism, Echoes of a Revolution. I'm here on the grounds of the museum where the Brandywine River flows past our galleries, giving visitors a peaceful, idyllic landscape, both inside the galleries and out. 
The importance of place in art at the Brandywine is evident to visitors who can see for themselves how the landscape of the Brandywine region influenced artists over generations. This place was particularly important to the Wyeth family of artists who made their homes and studios here, several of which can be toured as part of the museum's historic properties. Place is important to this exhibition as well. More than any other American Impressionism exhibition that's come before, this show examines the role that location played in spreading the style across the country. From the French village of Giverny to the shores of New England, through the mid-Atlantic, down to the Texas Hill Country, and out to the rocky coast of California. I want to share with you just a few of the works that are important not just as foundations to American Impressionism, but as building blocks for this exhibition. Through them, you'll be able to see the genesis of this story at the Brandywine River Museum of Art. I begin in France with two small works by Willard Metcalf, the first artist to paint in Giverny, where French Impressionist Claude Monet made his home. Monet and his paintings would become a touchstone for American Impressionist artists. The significance of the Giverny experience is revealed in these works, Monet's Formal Garden of 1885 and Poppy Field, Landscape at Giverny of 1886. I have often used these two paintings in teaching and lecturing to pinpoint the very first breaths of American Impressionism. But I should mention that both works are in private collections, rarely seen in public and never together. For the first time in this exhibition, they are displayed together and relay the story of Metcalfe's first encounters in Giverny. In 1885, on his first trip, he requested permission to paint in Monet's elaborate garden. Though denied entry to the main garden, he was allowed to paint in the kitchen garden, seen here, that supplied Monet's table with both delicious vegetables and delightful peonies. The 1886 poppy scene is also a tribute to Monet, who had painted a very similar scene the year before, during Metcalfe's first visit. Inscribed on the back of the painting is a note by Metcalfe reading, Maison de Claude Monet, Giverny, looking from the end of my garden. So Metcalfe had returned to Giverny a year later, renting a home where he could literally watch over Monet. Two other paintings in the exhibition help to illustrate the birth of the exhibition at the Brandywine and other important aspects of the exhibition. Theodore Robinson's Yacht Club Basin, Coscob Harbor, and Edward Redfield's Garden of the Girls. Robinson was close to Monet, one of the few American artists to earn the respect of the French master. After working for years in Giverny, Robinson returned to the United States and painted a suite of views of the Yacht Club Basin in Coscob, Connecticut. The town was home to an artist's colony that boldly exercised the tenets of Impressionism. One of the views of the Yacht Club is in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. A second is in a private collection and will be on view at the San Antonio Museum of Art when the exhibition arrives there. The third one, seen here, is a recent acquisition of the Brandywine River Museum of Art from the bequest of Richard Mellon Scaife. Mr. Scaife's generous bequest endowed the Brandywine with many fine new works of American Impressionism, including Redfield's Garden of the Girls. Redfield was one of the prime practitioners of Pennsylvania Impressionism, several works of which are included in the exhibition. Redfield's painting, however, was created between 1928 and 1930, well after Metcalfe's first visit to Giverny. Another of the themes of our exhibition is the acknowledgement of the long life of Impressionism in the United States. The style continued to grow and shape to the contours of the American landscape well into the 20th century. These are just a few of the works of art that helped to shape this exhibition through its development over several years. 
but works of art alone do not create an exhibition. I want to take this moment to thank in particular our colleagues at the San Antonio Museum of Art and at the Dixon Gallery and Gardens, Kevin, Julie, and the rest of the staff for steering this exhibition into port in Memphis today. Hi, I'm Suzanne Weaver, the Interim Chief Curator and the uh, Brown Foundation Curator of Modern and Con Contemporary Art here at the San Antonio Museum of Art. And we wish we could be there at the opening. Uh, so today, though, I'm with a great stellar crew of reparators and our head registrar and uh, Director of Exhibitions and Collections. Uh, we're going to uh, say goodbye. I will introduce you to the work and we'll say goodbye to the work and soon it will be joining uh, you at the uh, Dixon Museum in, in uh, Memphis. And I just want to say it has been great. Uh, one of the things that has happened with this COVID uh, situation, pandemic, is this opportunity to work with people in a very close, collaborative way. And I've just loved, and Heather Heather Fulton and I and everyone here at the San Antonio Museum have loved collaborating with the Brandywine and with the Memphis, uh, with the Dixon. And um, it's been such a process of trying to keep the show going, keep it together. And I love everyone's flexibility, the ability to pivot. And um, I always think of Dorothy Hamill or Peggy Fleming and ice skating and how wonderful it is that we can just keep pivoting and being very flexible and pulling this beautiful show and keeping it going. And I'll just tell you a little bit about this work by um, Lilla Cabot Perry and what is so great about the fact that the San Antonio Museum has this beautiful painting by a woman. And what has been so great about this exhibition is that it is bringing us more awareness of the diversity in, Amer in American Impressionism. We all think we know what American Impressionism is, but what's so great about the show is this bringing us new perspectives and new narratives about American Impressionism and the fact that there are women, really amazing women that have contributed to this story and this narrative. And we have a great example, uh, example of one of the women artists uh, Lily Cabot Perry. She was um, an artist that worked for many years uh, and lived in Germany. She was a good friend of Monet and she also traveled extensively. She is of the uh, Cabot family in uh, Boston, the Brahmin family, and she is also married to the grand nephew of, uh, of, of um, Commodore Perry. So she traveled much to Japan. And you can see in her paintings, you can see this wonderful patterns in the way that you can see a real influence of Japanese art. And so many artists of this period, they traveled extensively, they, they gained a lot of experience of other countries and geographies. And through that, they have had very wonderful observation of their landscape. And they brought together not only the influences, but their own personal experiences and a deep commitment to observing their surroundings and landscape. So I wish we could be there at the opening, but it's been so great working with you guys. And we can't, we wish you much success in the opening and the show. And we'll see everyone soon. Thank you. Hello, good evening. My name is Heather Snow Fulton, and I am the Director of Registration and Collections at the San Antonio Museum of Art. My job in putting this exhibition together was to act as the tour registrar, which basically means I'm responsible for the logistics of getting the paintings from the lenders, lending institutions um, on the road, in the trucks, packed up and ready to go to each of the venues. I'm standing here today with two of the three loans that are coming from the San Antonio Museum of Art. And both of these painters, Julian Onderdonk and Jose Arpa, have roots in San Antonio. Julian Onderdonk was born in San Antonio and he worked here. Uh, Arpa was born in Spain and then moved to San Antonio. And they were both hometown heroes for us and very well respected here at the museum. 
Near San Antonio by Julian Onderdonk circa 1918 is usually found on our third floor in our Texas gallery. It's a very well-traveled painting. It's been to the White House. It's spent four years in the Oval Office in, during uh, George W. Bush's term. And the ARPA is a new acquisition. We purchased it in 2014, and this will be its very first venture outside of the museum, and we are thrilled to be able to share it with you. And I'd like to say a personal thank you to Kevin Sharp, who has been such a great cheerleader throughout this process. We have encountered a lot of difficulties. We've had to redo our contracts three times, postpone the exhibition dates a couple of times, and Kevin has really been kind of a shining light, uh, helping me uh, realize that <laughs> it's all going to be okay. And I'd also like to thank Kristen Kimberling, the registrar at the Dixon, who has been an amazing help and will stand in for me during the initial installation since I will be unable to travel there. So, enjoy. You should tell, I wanted to show you this painting too that's in the exhibition. It's called The Mantle of Spring by William Wendt, who's a California painter. Um, it's certainly one of the biggest paintings in the show, but I think one of the most beautiful and powerful too. Um, so William Wendt's actually a uh, German-born painter, but he goes to California at, right around the time of the great earthquake in San Francisco in 1906. Um, so his, his paintings of California, I think a lot of times, show the beauty of that region, but also a little bit of the power of the landscape, I think. Uh, certainly the size of this painting and its high horizon line gives us kind of an overwhelming sense um, of the landscape there. So it's painted in this really beautiful spring green where we're getting that perfect lushness of spring before it gets to that kind of heaviness of summer. Um, but it's painted with this kind of energetic brushwork. Um, but when you take a step back from it, it's really such a beautiful painting. And I think when this painting in particular kind of walks a line between being, having this kind of, you know, beautiful, tender, poetic quality, but at the same time, the, the size of it and the, like I said, the high horizon line give you a kind of a dramatic um, feeling, kind of gives you a sense of drama when you're standing in front of it. So yeah, one of the great things about America's Impressionism is that we get, you know, we get all the way from France to California, I think, in this, and it really shows the spread of the Impressionist technique um, all over the United States, and Wendt is certainly one of the most important of the California Impressionists, and this is a masterwork by him, I think. I love having it. Awesome, thank you. My name is Jimsy Ayers. I'm so thrilled and honored to be given the opportunity to show my work at the Dixon. We in Memphis are so lucky to have such an interesting museum set in such beautiful and thoughtfully tended gardens. It may not be obvious from looking at this show, but I came out of the womb, so to speak, as an abstract painter. There simply was not a lot of realist instruction available to me in the 70s when dinosaurs roamed the earth. But at 18, I knew I wanted to be an artist and I didn't care what I painted as long as somebody was gonna let me paint. Over the years, as I discovered my voice, it became more important to me to connect with people in a more material and less conceptual way. I'm not sure why really, finding your voice as a young creative is such a squirrely nebulous process. I can only say that after returning home to the verdant Southern landscape from semi-arid San Diego, I embraced the rhythms and forms of the Delta. While still painting in a less representational and more emotive way, I worked in the way I had been taught, always and ever in my studio. I thought the idea of putting on a hat and getting outside was trite. So about 11 years ago, during a fallow period, a teacher suggested to me that I get outside. For a landscape painter, 
It's the only way to remain fresh, he said. So that's just what I did. I embarked on a challenging journey to learn the discipline of plein air painting. It has taken several years even to scratch the surface of this difficult practice, during which I've had to be patient and allow myself to fail miserably over and over again. In the process, I was fortunate to learn so much about color handling, light, composition, and all the other mechanics of painting, more than I've learned really since college. In the past year, however, I have been more focused on drawing when I'm outside. I find that not having to think about color frees me up to be more creative with the shapes I'm seeing, with the value structure, so that when I return to the studio, what emerges is the product of my own mind. I can have both worlds at play, the external world of nature, light, form, and the internal landscape of emotion and imagination. Coming out on the other side of that learning process, I have returned to the call of my own voice. Painting and drawing from life, for me, is not only about realism, it is a springboard into my own emotional landscape. In January, when I first talked to Julie Parati about doing this exhibit, I was looking forward to a trip to Provence, which would have happened in October. I thought it would give me lots of inspiration for a show to be held in conjunction with the American Impressionists. But as with so many things last year, it was not to be, the trip didn't happen. And in the meantime, I began to venture out in my own neighborhood to see what I could see. I tried to go without any preconceived ideas about what I would find, knowing only that there would be inspiration. I was also trying not to panic. What I found were people coping as I was, walking their dogs, teaching their children how to ride bikes, trying desperately to hold private conversations, shouted over the six foot gulf that surrounds us all at this moment. I saw sidewalk chalk messages pinned to people and pets who might be passing. I painted people on the street and in farmer's markets, masks on, certain that the impressionist would have done the same thing. I responded to it all and I found inspiration in the creativity of the people around me. I wonder if any of you have been inspired by the creativity of others. <clears throat> It nearly always works its magic on me. While the work began to coalesce around these ideas, I was paying attention to my mostly daily practice of journaling and also reading a lot of poetry. Mary Oliver is one of my favorite contemporary poets, so it's natural for me to turn to her work for all sorts of reasons, really. On one particular morning, as will happen, I opened her 2006 collection, Thirst, to the poem Messenger. As I read, I had one of those startling moments when I recognized every word, every syllable as deeply connected to my own experience and philosophy. I hope if you're interested that you'll take the time to read this poem. I hearkened back to Messenger almost daily as I moved through this body of work. I feel as though Mary Oliver's life and work were so deeply intertwined that they must have been inseparable, as is true for me. As a result, what you'll see in this show is my external world filtered through the lens of my internal landscape. We made the decision to show some of the plein air sketches for two reasons, at least in my mind. 
first, to show a part of my process in developing this show, and secondly, to establish the link that exists between contemporary painters who record their lives and times and the Impressionists, American and French, who were great chroniclers of the beauty they observed in everyday life. The common thread running through these two moments in the continuum of painting, that is the contemporary and the late 19th century of seeing and interpreting is paying attention to the beauty all around us. I feel a real kinship with the American Impressionists for their commitment to their craft and for their way of showing the audience the beauty to be found everywhere every day. Even decay is beautiful. The observation of the world is my delight. I'm never bored because I am in a sense always working, watching the way the light filters through trees, the color permutations and cast shadows, the way that backlighting illuminates things, making them seem as though they are lit from within. My message could, I guess, be distilled into this. Next time you're walking down the street, look. Pay attention to the way light bounces off a sidewalk to bloom onto the side of a house or the underside of a tree, whose shadows are now enlivened by a different color altogether. Watch the light unspool across the lawn of your neighborhood park and feel gratitude for all the loveliness that surrounds you. Watch people interact and note the small ways in which they express love for each other. There are so many things that make life magical and lovely that the ability to take it all in and express my love for the world in paint is what makes me bow my head in astonishment and gratitude. Thank you very much. Hi, welcome to the Liz and Tommy Farnsworth Education Building Interactive Gallery New Exhibition Charging Station. We created this exhibition with the idea that we all need at this moment to reset, restart, reconnect, and recharge. Uh, some of the components that you will see in this exhibition talk to the idea of movement, laughter, but also meditation, and uh, kind of reconnect it with oneself. Uh, we hope you really can come and experiment and experience this beautiful exhibition that also will take you into the gardens and in the galleries with some really special charging spots. Hope you can come and enjoy it and come recharge yourself at the charging station. When you're here in the charging station, make sure you stand in the middle of the gallery and look up. There's a very special surprise and a really great component that will take you to the skies. I hope you can come visit Charging Station. It will be up until May 9th, 2021. And with that, I'm gonna leave you with one of my favorite jokes in the exhibition. Here we go. ¿Sabes qué le dice un jaguar a otro? How are you? <laughs> the question and answer portion of our event is coming up next. Okay, hello again. And thank you for joining us for the virtual opening of America's Impressionism, Echoes of a Revolution. I am Chantel Drake, and I'm here with Kevin Sharp and Aaron Reardon. Hi, Aaron. Hi. <laughs> and very special guest, Amanda Burden, curator at the Brandywine River Museum, and William Rudolph, former chief curator at San Antonio Museum and current deputy director of curatorial affairs at Nelson Atkins Museum. Welcome to each of you. Thank you so much for being here. So I hope everyone enjoyed that fantastic tour and sneak peek into the exhibition. We have a great discussion for everyone tonight, but I need to make a few announcements first. Let me start by saying thank you. If you are attending the event tonight, you are what we consider an important and invaluable supporter of the Dixon. You have either given your resources or given your time or given an indispensable commitment to the Dixon in some way. And tonight's virtual opening is for you to show our appreciation, 
and to give you access to those responsible for bringing this exhibition to the Dixon. We're also joined by Julie Parati. Hello, Julie. <laughs> Sorry, I'm having internet trouble. It's okay, it's okay. Um, so speaking of access, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to submit questions to any of the panelists about America's Impressionism. They want to hear from you. We want to hear from you. Don't be shy, submit your questions. Also, if my video is very large on your screen right now, and all of the other panelists are very small somewhere else on your screen, <laughs> just click the view icon in the top right corner of your screen and change it from speaker view to gallery view. And that should do it. Lastly, the exhibition opens this Sunday. And as the tradition, as is the tradition of opening weekends at the Dixon, we will host an opening lecture, virtually of course, with Amanda, one of our special guests tonight. She will discuss anticipating a revolution, the preconditions of American Impressionism. And that is this Sunday at 2 p.m. Link and registration information is on our website. So please join Amanda on Sunday. Okay, now we can get started. Um, I have a few questions to get us going, and then I'm gonna pull questions from the audience as they come in. But once again, thank you to all of you for participating in our first virtual opening tonight. I'm gonna to get started with Amanda. And Amanda, your question is, location was mentioned as a unifying theme during the tour. As the curator, why was the role of location so important with this exhibition? And please unmute. <laughs> thank you Chantal thank you everybody that was my first time seeing the video it was spectacular I wish I could be there um, I can't wait till I can come to Memphis um, but you know everyone in that video talked about location the place where things were painted or the place where artists went to train and learn the style of impressionism and one of the things I think as an Americanist, someone who studies American painting that I'm always interested in is how a style transfers from one place to another. And sometimes that's from Paris to the States and sometimes that's from New York to Texas. Um, but that those pathways of transmission across the country are fascinating to me. And it's no wonder I collect maps as well um, because I just love to look at the passages between these places. So location is important in this show because, you know, sort of as Kevin mentioned, there have been a lot of shows and books and a lot of things written about American Impressionism. And if we want to poke and prod and see something new about it, we need to take a new angle. And looking at how that progression continued from France to, of course, New England or New York, but beyond those, um, beyond those state boundaries and how an artist in New Mexico or an artist in Texas or an artist in California change the style to make it relevant for their own audiences. It's just fascinating to watch how artists in the United States take an idea from somewhere else and make it relevant here. And so that's one of the reasons um, that I have been doing a lot of projects about both France and the United States and then about trans uh, national styles because it's a story that is not fully told yet. Thank you. And I meant to say before Amanda started speaking, if any other panelists have anything to add, just jump in um, on the topic that I asked someone else. It's okay. <laughs> um, so you mind if I jump in, Chantel? Yeah, jump in, please. Well, I, you know, I'll just add to the um, to Amanda's point. You know, it, it took me a little while. You know, first of all, the Dixon was the was the um, third institution to come on board in this in this project. And it kind of took me a while to catch up with um, with Amanda's thinking and um, and the 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 idea of framing the show through um, through the landscape essentially. I mean, virtually every work in the exhibition is a landscape. It's just, I mean, it's not that it's not that that American um, impressionist landscapes haven't been examined, but not in the same not in the same way not with this very kind of focused idea of place. And then once, you know, once we got the whole, kind of the whole team on board, basically getting me caught up a little bit, um, 
I mean, we really began to we really began to look far and wide and kind of stretch the boundaries a little bit of of what this of what this um, exhibition was going to be. One of the things that Amanda and William and I talked about, and Amanda just touched on it. Um, you know, there's been really good work done on American Impressionism, but, um, and you know, there is no but. There's been really good work done on American Impressionism. We wanted to do something different. We wanted to do something that hadn't been done before. And, um, and I think Amanda really nailed it. That's awesome. I thought you were gonna say there's been a lot of work done, but we're gonna do it better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That, that's that's implied. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's it. We do have a couple of questions coming in the Q&A, but I wanted to ask William something just to stay with the location theme. Um, Underdunk is an artist from San Antonio that both Kev Kevin and Heather mentioned mm -hmm. during the tour. Um, his painting in the show graced the walls of the Oval Office, which mm -hmm. is so cool. But how did Impressionism reach Texas? And what should audiences know about Texas Impressionism? Well, thank you, Chantel. And thank you to my colleagues, um, especially a great thank you to Amanda. This is her show. This is her project that she has seen through so many hurdles. And I'm just so thrilled to, be, to have been able to be part of it. And to, I'm so envious of you all in Memphis that you get to see it. Um, we were supposed to have it in San Antonio in June of 2020, but you know, it will come. It will come this fall to San Antonio. And hopefully I will be able to return to my former home in South Texas to see th those friends of paintings and all sorts of wonderful things on the walls. That being said, actually how Impressionism came to Texas is something that is part of what makes Texas art actually quite distinctive and wonderful because the secret that should not be a secret that my colleagues and I who have worked in Texas are keep advocating very loudly, or we hope we are, is that every artistic trend in Texas has always been driven by women. Women were the first professionally trained artists in Texas. They were the founders of the museums, including San Antonio Museum of Art, which dates back to 1928. Uh, they were the first gallerists, they were the first collectors, and they were the first artists to adopt every stylistic trend that later became a macro style. So Impressionism, which dominates painting in Texas for 50 years, um, to the point that by 1936, by the centennial, it's like, you know, on its deathbed, <laughs> sort of, but was br also brought into the state by Emma Richardson Cherry who had moved to Houston, brought together, she had studied in New York and traveled and worked in Giverny and she organized this absolutely insane like four day show on the Gulf Coast in 1896 with 250 works of art on the checklist. And if you think, you know, we freak out <laughs> about, you know, 72 works or whatever that we have years to put together yeah. for 12 weeks, Emma Richardson Cherry throws together 250 things. So maybe we should all shut up. But the point, <laughs> of, my, the point of my long story is that Emma Richardson Cherry brings Impressionism to Texas and it's a revelation. And then through her own work and then also through luring colleagues who she had met abroad, many of whom were, were international artists to come to Texas. And then through the efforts of early curators, Julian Onderdonk was one and early artists and early teachers, it really takes shape, but it's the women. And as a side note, the other artist you need to go Google when we're done here is Tony, T-O-N-I, La Cell, who is the first woman to commit, first artist to commit to abstraction in Texas, which she does in 48. Um, Nebraska born, uh, Chicago Bauhaus trained, student of Hans Hoffman. So there's a story all along about women artists in Texas. And I kind of say that because I want to give Amanda total props because Amanda did this amazing show um, in last year, which you know the pandemic made it harder to see, but she did this terrific show about the centennial of, of many women receiving the right to vote. And so I know it's something she's really interested in. And the Texas story, I think, wonderfully plays into other 
stories on the checklist, which is really about the fact that Impressionism was inclusive in many ways from day one. So that's my long, long spiel. <laughs> that's awesome. And that's such interesting information about women artists in Texas. Um, I don't think I would have ever known that had you not said that I wouldn't have researched it for myself. I'm going to ask um, a follow-up question about women artists in this exhibition, but I wanna to get to some of the questions in the Q&A. We have one for Amanda, William, and Kevin. What have been your institution's most successful exhibitions? And I guess a follow-up question to that, to that is why. So um, different regions, we got Pennsylvania, Texas, Memphis. Um, Amanda, you wanna go first? Yeah, I can go first because I kind of touched on it in my little video clip. The Brandywine is located in Chadsford, Pennsylvania, which is the home of the Wyeth family and the Howard Pyle School of Illustration. So by far our most popular exhibitions, the ones we get international draws to come and see are the Wyeth family um, exhibitions. Uh, just a couple of years ago, 2017, was the centennial of the birth of Andrew Wyeth, and we had a major exhibition uh, that traveled um, to Seattle as well. It was hundreds, uh, more than 100 paintings and took up two floors of our museum. Just uh, a few years before that, the Jamie Wyeth retrospective that the San Antonio Museum of Art also hosted was at the Brandywine. The Boston Museum of Fine Arts put that together and then just, uh, oh my gosh, is it last year or sometime before the pandemic um, was the NC Wyeth retrospective. You know, one of the reasons why the Wyeth family is so important to us is they lived there, but they also donated their homes and studios to our museum. So when you come to the Brandywine, you see their paintings, but you can also walk through their homes and go to the artist's studios and see them as they left them. So that was an easy question for us. It's YF world here. <laughs> and I guess, William, you can talk about San Antonio or sure. you could talk about Missouri. I don't know which well, way. I'm still learning my attendance figures for okay. the most thing. But so I can, I can talk to San Antonio's history. Um, the, 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 the most attendance grabbing exhibitions, really the, the one that shattered everything was the Sp Splendors, uh, 30 centuries of, of Mexican art that that the Met organized and San Antonio took and that was gosh 91 maybe something like that I mean that was a record breaker and, and our members still talk about it um, then also Chihuly actually no surprise there um, and then two shows during my seven years there one was Matisse Life in Color which had been organized by Baltimore of their terrific cone collection and we along with um, Minneapolis Institute of Art uh, and uh, Indianapolis were venues. And then a show that we put together um, just a few years ago in celebration of San Antonio's tricentennial in 2018, uh, a show of Spanish painting spanning um, 500 years of Spanish painting drawn from eight major museums in Madrid. So those were, so a very, a very uh, wide ranging group. Yeah. Um, so, but, but some of that has a great core in, um, in San, San Antonio's uh, bicultural heritage for 300 plus years as having been one of the northern most outposts of New Spain. Awesome. All right, Julie, Devin. Julie, you want to field this one? Mm, our most popular exhibitions. The ones we get the most, and Kevin, you can probably chime in on here too. The ones people talk about the most are Chihuly, uh, the Rodan show we did in the 80s, I think at least once a month, twice a month, people say something to me about that. <laughs> um, but in recent memory, our Isabel de Borsgrave show, I think, was kind of our blockbuster show where we had the most people. I mean, in, in that show, people came to see that seven, eight times. There were people that were like, I come to see this once a week. So um yeah, Our four end show in 2011 was also really popular. Kevin, I don't know, what am I forgetting? Well, nothing. I think you're, I mean, I think Isabel de Borsgrave was probably the most popular show since we've been there, but we, uh, we always do well um, when we find ourselves in the world of impressionism, mm -hmm. whatever the, whatever the, you know, the, um, whether it's French or uh, American painters or both. Um, and it's in part because that's the strength of our collection. And, and so it, it, for our local audiences, I think it feels 
you know, when we're when we're exploring some element of impressionism, as we've done with Jean Louis Foran, and as we've done with with Helen Turner, and as we've done with, um, you know, I mean, even even the the Rodin show that we did, um, mm -hmm. you know, we we're kind of on our we're kind of on our home turf, and our and that's it's almost like a, a cue for our local audiences to to come out and see it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, we have another question. Um, how, Kevin and Julie, this is for you. How will this view on landscape influence our future exhibitions at the Dixon? Mm. Oh, great question. Well, well I mean, you know, oh, go, go ahead, ahead Kevin. Julie. No, go ahead. You go ahead. <laughs> well, I was thinking while Amanda was talking about place, it was like, do I really think about that when I'm writing labels for our permanent collection? Um, we're just um, reinstalled, we've just reinstalled the permanent collection um, in the residence and it's kind of spilled out into uh, some of the galleries. And Kevin did that by, um, and arranged everything by color, but I've thought, hmm, do we ever really, how, how often do we really take a deep dive into the places where our landscapes were made? Um, we'll mention it, you know, this was done at Aaron Yee or this was done, you know, along the Seine in Paris, but Maybe, I mean, it's just interesting to note that. And why was that artist there at that moment? And who else was there with him? And, you know, uh, the interesting thing about, you know, uh, Theodore Robinson being Monet's neighbor and Metcalf buying this house where he could look out onto Monet's garden. Um, so I think it's an interesting way to think about our permanent collection. Now, in terms of exhibitions that we have, you know, be interesting to think about that in terms of our own collection and and French impressionism too for exhibitions going forward. Yeah, yeah, you know, I had a a little moment before, kind of before I came to the Dixon in two thousand seven, um, where I was exploring Hudson River School painting, mm -hmm. and I got very interested in the idea of place in in that context mm -hmm. and. And because I didn't really know that much about Hudson River School painting before I found myself kind of immersed in it, um, you know, I, it was understanding where these painters are, are painting really, really mattered. And mm -hmm. or, or certainly mattered, mattered to me. And it also kind of coincided with the, the um, emergence of Google Maps, mm. and which was, you know, I'm kind of like, a ma I don't collect maps, but I, but I love maps. And I'm fascinated, you know, I'm fascinated by, you know, by, you know, the information that you can glean just from looking at a place mm -hmm. on the map. You actually visit the place and try to pinpoint where an artist was, was um, painting. Well, that's, that's kind of interesting. And so um, I would say that, you know, to, to actually answer the question, you know, I think Amanda has opened up something really, really interesting here, and we've got a we've got a lot of landscape painting in our collection, and mm -hmm. burrowing into any one of those works and seeing what we can distill from it in terms of the the where of its making could be you know could be a, a jumping off point for any number of shows. Mm -hmm. You know, Definitely. I'm thinking. You know, what I'm thinking of I'm thinking of the Cecily that. Our Alfred Cecily painting that depicts the Pont de Sèvres, the mm -hmm. you know, the bridge that leads across the Seine to the to the town of Sèvres, where they make you know where they make porcelain, which porcelain. is this other <laughs> big investment um, that Dixon has. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. I'm actually a little jealous because you know we have some lovely 18th century porcelain at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. But with your mice and you blow us out of the water. I, guess <laughs> I did say that out loud. Um, oops. Okay, but, you just did, William. <laughs> but yeah, it's a it's a great love of mine. And my next visit to Memphis, you know where I'm going to be. I'm going to be mm -hmm. with my nose pressed up against the cases of the porcelain. But you know, you raised something quite quite interesting because the challenges of the last ten months really. I mean, what have they done if not make us intensely aware of place? Because mm -hmm. most of us either haven't gone anywhere or maybe we shouldn't be going anywhere, quite frankly. Um, and, you know, when we're in our little Zoom boxes or our homes or sometimes work or things like this. So we're acutely, acutely aware of the worlds in which we live, maybe in ways that we weren't when art moved effortlessly around the globe and people mm -hmm. moved effortlessly around the globe. And, and so 
maybe that's an interesting lesson for us and for our visitors to just, yeah, to pay attention to where we are and what we're looking at and what the artist was looking at when the artist made it. And it's, you know, I'm an optimist, so I'm always trying to think of, okay, turn it around and see the positive. So maybe that, maybe that is a positive, mm-hmm. that kind of experience we've had in our own lives of being so attuned to very specific places lets us think about the plate, you know, how artists were attuned to very particular places when the works were actually being made. And so maybe mm-hmm. very wonderfully in ways that we weren't emphasizing before, we can encourage ourselves and our visitors to see what, how the artist saw, see what the artist saw, and, mm-hmm. and, or also see what the first viewers saw. So I'm, I'm kind of excited about this. Maybe it's just my way of coping, but these are the kind of things we're thinking about, actually, our team here at the Nelson, you know, as we start looking at, we've had the time to look at our labels and, and ask questions about, okay, mm-hmm. is this really what we want to be saying? And, and what would we say? So who knows? Well, we can thank Kristen Newman for that question that has sparked such excitement <laughs> around um, job, Kristen. William and, and the Dixon's um, exhibitions. We also have another question who's come that has come in the Q&A, and this is from Chris Richards. Um, were the artists in this exhibition and their art accepted and appreciated for their work in their lifetimes, or did they face criticism for this style? And anybody can jump in. So I'll jump in and I'll start at the end because by the end um, of the period that when these um, American Impressionists were working, it is almost like um, uh, Kevin said, the national or the state style of Texas. It's like the national style, the World's Fairs in 1893 and then in 1917 really pushed this style as a national style. So the acceptance was there, but it was tough to get there. And that was the same with the French Impressionists as well. Um, You know, it it was very new and different and shocking from what had come before this academic training and the entrenchment of tradition and working in the style of the master. And when Impressionism as this first wave of modernism blew that up, um, the doors were open all over the place. And so the idea that some people were willing and ready for a new style, that's great. But can you imagine a brand new style that no one has ever seen or heard of before coming on the scene? There were certainly those who held um, their judgment in reserve and criticized it harshly. I kind of always go back to one of the American reviewers of one of the first um, French Impressionist shows in the United States that referred to um, one of the paintings as a mayonnaise of tomatoes on the canvas, right? (laughs) I mean, the best way to describe it was to ridicule it for the public, which it probably only added to its popularity. People loved reading the stuff. Um, And gradually um, with people like Mary Cassatt working with major collectors like the Havemeyers with Theodore Robinson doing his writing and his work in his short life back in the United States, helping the, 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 the various audiences, the critics, the collectors, other artists, mainstream Americans, to see and understand how this new style could work for them. Um, so it was a struggle, but once that struggle was surmounted, it, it sort of like landed on the easels and wouldn't leave. <laughs> Any- Anything else, anybody else want to add to that, Kevin? Well, yeah, I mean, one of the, th- one of the things that, that um, Amanda allowed me to do in the, in the catalog was write about the durability of American Impressionism and just what a long shelf life it had. And, um, and this is kind of an answer to Chris's question. Um, one of the things that I found interesting, you know, as I was looking at, American Impressionism in the, you know the after 1913 and 1913 is this this watershed moment when the Armory Show happens and Americans have this exposure to to Picasso and Matisse and to you know isms that are coming 
you know, uh, coming fast and furious out of Europe. Um, uh, uh, American arts writers are calling, you know, anything, anything that um, isn't impressionism becomes post-impressionism. So Matisse is a post-impressionist. Picasso is a post-impressionist. And that's just how, how strongly entrenched the style had, had um, become by that, by that time. And I mean, obviously there are, there is a thing called post-impressionism, but I don't think Picasso would have considered himself one. So anyway, it's, yeah, these artists, um, there was definitely struggle, but there was, there was also definitely redemption. Okay. All right. So I'm going to ask one more question. And then if we have more questions come in the Q and A, then we'll, ask those and y'all can answer those as well. But if not, we might just end with this one. And it's a follow-up to what William was saying about Texas women artists. Um, it was mentioned a few times during the tour that this exhibition includes more women artists than other Impressionist exhibitions. Um, why were women artists drawn to Impressionism? And why is it so important to include women artists in the Im American Impressionist story? So. I feel like I've been answering that question for 25 years at this point because um, I wrote a dissertation about the women artists from the United States who were working in France and, and they were all Mary Cassatt's friends, not Mary Cassatt, but Mary Cassatt's friends. And it made me realize how this idea that a new style was opening up and there weren't rules about where you had to go to school and who you had to study with. And um, there, were, there were role models like Cassatt and Bert Morceau who were leading impressionists meant that um, a, a woman artist in the United States had so much more opportunity to join um, into this style. And in fact, people like William Merritt Chase hope opened schools that were really directed at women's students. Um, and it gave women a way to interact in the landscape that they had never been invited to do before. Landscape painting was something that men did on like an expedition to the West, right? And, and women artists uh, now had the opportunity to go to these training grounds, whereas the academies, you know, the French Ecole de Beaux-Arts still didn't accept women until the eight, into the 1890s. So as Americans were coming to France, they were going to these smaller schools, the Académie Julienne and the private studios and the, and the colonies in, around Normandy. And women were just as accepted there as men students. And so what I've been studying is the role of women artists, but of women in general, but women artists on America's cultural identity in this post-Civil War period. And so it's so important as you all, as, as William was saying, women, sometimes they wanted to be artists, but the society they were living in and the city they were living in was not having it. So they founded art museums and they started art clubs and they started collecting and they did uh, uh, teaching and they wrote for art periodicals and did all sorts of other cultural work. And I think the artists in this show are, you know, just the leading edge of, of the women um, who can now be seen for what they really were doing in the late 19th and early 20th century in a way that they've been sort of blocked from seeing. If we just look at like the three most famous painters of American Impressionism, um, you're, you're rarely gonna get a woman in there, but the great breadth and opportunity that was uh, offered by this style was something women artists took advantage of. Great, anybody wanna add anything to that? Well, it was kind of a perfect storm, you know. Uh, why are you laughing? I didn't call on you, but I was looking well, at you. Well, you said anybody. You said anybody. <laughs> but it was. It was, and I'm about to make a brilliant point. So. I know you are. I know, I know you are. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just this perfect, you know, if you think about all the things that are happening for women in this, in this moment, um, you know, everything from, you know, from the emergence of, of feminism to a, to the suffrage movement, um, you know, all of these things gave, gave agency um, to women. And I think that, and, uh, you know, and uh, women seized it, 
and and absolutely it, the, the arts were a critical part. They weren't just a, an appendage to all of this. The visual arts were, were critical to, to all of the social change that would that would happen eventually happen in the in the early 20th century. So and you know the, I'll also just add that uh, this I mean, the story that William told was just so spot on and so so perfect and so interesting. And I think that same story can be told about a lot of places, in, including including you know California, which we look at fairly thoroughly in this in this exhibition. So um, yeah, it's good stuff. And that was a brilliant point, Kevin. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for recognizing it, Chantel. <laughs> okay, so we have um, one other question that's come in and um, we, we might need a follow-up question, but what percentage of major exhibitions are of impressionist paintings? And I don't know, I don't know if she means the Dixon or um, nationally, but let's start with the Dixon first and then we can maybe mm -hmm move to other museums and mm. what we think the country That's a tough can. question. <laughs> it kind of varies per institution. I guess yeah. at the Dixon, we, I mean, it's not even, not every year that we do something that's specifically on some form of impressionism, but of course our permanent collection, you know, that style of painting is always up. Yeah, but, but we circle back about, we circle back, you know, I mean, maybe not every year, but certainly if we haven't had an had a show that looks at some element, mm -hmm. you know, with in a two year period, we start we start looking for something. And okay. you know, and is... when, and when um, you know, it took us about a nanosecond to jump on this project when yes. Amanda and Tom Payton, the director at Brandywine, put, um, you know, tossed it out there. Um, so you know, we're we have we have a pretty healthy appetite, but it, you know, nationally and internationally, gosh, I, I, I have no idea. Well, you know, one thing to put in a little perspective is in Giverny in France, there is a museum that used to be of American Impressionism, but now it's mm -hmm. of Impressionisms all over the place because global mm -hmm. Impressionism and the fact that people are looking at global styles of Impressionism right now is, mm -hmm. is really on the rise. Mm -hmm. um, so the very fact that there's a museum dedicated to this one style where anybody who's interested, I mean, I know I've been there and you can't, <laughs> um, it, it, the collection is amazing. And, um, you know, for a certain style to have a dedicated institution for it, um, it, it kind of demonstrates its popularity. Yeah. I think that what's interesting about the question is that Amanda's show that, that we all were lucky enough to work on actually is that, that it sort of gets at that question in the sense that it's really rather remarkable that a, that a, that, that a movement that started out with such critical opprobrium, right? Both in France and in this country wound up becoming certainly for us but also internationally you know first a dominant language of, of, of style across the U.S. and certainly in the museum industry a dominant language in you know over nearly 50 years worth of the sort of treadmill that many of us have been on ever since King Tut in one version or another you know that again maybe a good thing the reset that the pandemic provides maybe gets us off that hamster wheel so to speak mm -hmm. and lets us think about other things but you know, anecdotally, I think as curators, we all can talk about the fact that usually, you know, your marketing department, your development department, they would love you to do a lot of impressionism shows um, because there is a sort of built-in accessibility, which also I think this show helps explore, like, how did we get to that point that, that this becomes something that defines kind of user-friendly, user-friendly art for a lot of people when it certainly mm -hmm. didn't begin that way. I mean, I do, I can say that the most popular show in the last 10 years at the Nelson, my brain cells jogged, was when we reunited our part of a water lily triptych. There's, yeah. there's a triptych, there's our part, St. Louis has one of the other parts, Cleveland has one of the other parts. We brought them together and that is the most well-attended show at the Nelson that we did since the block building opened around 
2007 when we started tracking differently. So, you know, everybody has these metrics, but it is a fa it's a really fascinating question about mm -hmm. why this is so, because the work is actually tougher to look at as, as curators will tell you, if you really look at it, it's tougher to, it's, it's not the most user-friendly work to think mm -hmm. about, to work with, to see as the artist saw, but now the, the better question to ask is when curators are at conferences and they have a martini or two, <laughs> which occasionally apparently happens, right? You know, <laughs> we're all taking the fifth there. What, what, are the, what are the show titles they put together with each other as a joke to say, this is the show that would break all attendance records. <laughs> you know, like there's usually something like Monet in there. There might be something with Egypt. Maybe a cat. Rembrandt. Rembrandt, a cat. Yeah. A cat, you know, maybe cats somewhere, you know, Romanovs or something like, you know, I mean, we, we can all play this game. So maybe if you're lucky, the Dixon can do like a sort of crowdsourcing thing. You give a little money and Julie and Kevin will come up with, you know, it, it's like Jimmy Fallon. They'll come up with things to stump you about the show that could never happen. You know, maybe we should all sell that to our patrons. It could be fun, you know, as sort I'll of- I'll bring fun. the martinis. It'll be fun. Fun, <laughs> fun Zoom cocktails for, for stakeholders and, and curators where we try to invent the show that could never happen, but would break every record. <laughs> My team is behind the scenes right now, writing notes on everything that you're saying. <laughs> um, we do have um, one other question to kind of end the night. Um, how many paintings are included in the exhibition? How large is the exhibition? Amanda, do you know what our final number ended well, up being? I was gonna say, you just sent me the final checklist. Um, it's varying at each, at each stop. So I think the Brandywine might have 55 or all around there. And I know the Dixons added a couple of um, a couple of objects. I know San Antonio is going to add some health collection works. It's going to be a little bit different at each venue too. So of course you should go to all three venues. <laughs> I yeah, hope we can. Yeah, I hope we yeah. can. Travel by car, of course, just to be clear. <laughs> there is um, a beautiful catalog. Yes. Oh, yeah, but... That Amanda put together that Yale has published. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's really, really beautiful. A little biased here, but it's it's an extraordinarily beautiful object. And my colleagues who wrote for it, Kevin, Amanda, you know, the essay, and there's a host of other essays, Ross King, Emily, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's like, it's, you'll, you should buy it. You will not regret it. It's beautiful. You'll learn a lot. It's well-designed collector's item, and and if you drop it on your foot, you're gonna it's gonna hurt because there's a lot of scholar, there's a lot of scholarship in there, and it will hurt your toe. So be careful, with it, but you will enjoy it. Clearly, well, it's late at night, and I'm a little silly. It's because I'm, <laughs> because I'm so excited that America's impressionism is finally happening, and oh, that yeah. I get to see my great colleagues virtually. <laughs> Well, William, you're doing a little bit of my job for me. So thank you for telling everyone to buy the catalog. Um, that is all we have for you tonight. But please remember to join Amanda Sunday for the opening lecture and visit the Dixon soon to see the exhibition in person. As William says, it's a beautiful catalog. So while you're at the Dixon, make sure you stop by the store and purchase one for yourself. It really is beautiful. And I'm glad Kevin and Amanda both had a copy because I was supposed to have one near me and I don't. So if one of you can hold it up again, just to show the people what they can get. And thank you, Kevin. Um, that is available in our store. And thank you all so much for being here tonight. I think this was a lot of fun just to kind of hear a little bit about how the exhibition was organized. And we hope you enjoy the rest of your night. Have a fantastic weekend, be safe. And thank you all again for being here with us this evening. Thank you. Good night. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Great to see you guys. Bye.